Hello, and welcome to the Humumu Halloween Home Horror Hoedown. The podcast where we watch 31 horror movies throughout the hallowed month of October. Ranging from the critically acclaimed to film school projects gone gruesomely awry. And we take them all way too seriously. I'm your host, Mike Hummel. And I'm your host, Sully Hummel. Now warning, we use a ghoulish number of spoilers, so watch the movies first. Second warning, we don't know anything about anything, so don't take us seriously while we take these movies seriously. We discovered the Bad Ben movie series last year with the original film Bad Ben, which solely gave the coveted five some things out of five. I did. I gave that movie a five and I stand by it. Okay. Because I enjoyed that movie a lot. Five's worth. And I gave it a three, so I was okay with it. It was interesting. <laughs> I think you gave it more of the number it actually deserved. I I was scoring the original Bad Band entirely on an emotional level. Oh, hey, that's... Your experience with the film. Yes. Then, during that month, on Halloween Day, we went nuts, and we watched four movies that day. We watched Steelmanville Road, Batter Ben, Bad Ben the Mandela Effect, and The Crescent Moon Clown, all of which are the sequels to Bad Ben. And you gave a zero to The Crescent Moon Clown. Oh, it was terrible. There are ones all over the place. Batter Ben got a two from me, a three from you. The Mandela Effect, a two from me, a three and a half from you. So we were getting somewhere. So, But it was clear that the initial shine of Bad Ben had worn off. Yes. Like, it, it lasted through the first movie, and then the surprise element of it was lost. I think there might be more to it than that, in that I think... I haven't gone back and watched it, but I think the first movie is actually better than the rest by quite a bit. Well, and I should be clear, by surprise element, there's nothing all that surprising in the first no, movie. No, but yeah. But it was so surprisingly charming in how it was, like, done by this one guy in his house with a bunch of security cameras. And it was ridiculous in a way that was charming. Yeah. But also in a way where that charm quickly <laughs> wore off and became annoying. Yeah, it's fun the first time. So here we are for the sixth time. Mm. And we watch Bad Ben the Way In. And uh, this is the latest in the series. And this time, Tom Riley, who was the original person who had purchased the house in the original movie and was battling all of these demons. Tom Riley is now, like, he has sold the house and he has agreed to go back and, like, cleanse it of all these evil spirits who keep coming back and bringing yes. their friends, apparently. And he's agreed to do this for the new owner of the house because, as he says, thousands of times. I kept track up to four times that he gave this exact same speech. Oh, so many times. As he says, I need this money. Yes. I need the money this lady's paying me. Which is my main complaint with this story. And I think kind of stems from that same place of it was cute slash funny the first uh -huh. time and now six movies in it's like okay <laughs> really a half an hour of thought would make this movie more interesting because what it right. feels like there's no writing that goes into this there's no creative process going into making sure that it is coherent or interesting like it's just they sort of had a bullet a series of bullet points yeah he needs the money there are nine demons the basement they might have come up with that on the spot <laughs> Well, what they did is they went back through the other five movies and were like, how many demons have we introduced? And except, yeah, I'll get into that later about what a demon is. And uh, the last bullet point is the camera in the basement is broken. Yes. Like, they started with that, and then it's sort of like he just went into the house and, and told a bunch of friends, like, follow these bullet points, here are the demons, like, do stuff. Uh -huh. I don't need to know what you're going to do. I'll just go along with it. But he doesn't know how to go along with it. His ad libbing is terrible. So everything that happens, he either responds with anger. A lot of anger. Or I must be crazy. He said oh, that a bunch of times. I, 
I wanted to keep track of those numbers, but by the time I started, it was too late. But yeah, that had to be seven or eight times. Or I ought to just walk away from this thing, but I need this freaking money. Those mm-hmm. were the only ways he had to respond to anything that was going on. Yes. Yeah, everything. I My note was that the idea that you say, oh, I must be nuts to be doing this, doesn't excuse doing it. No. Like, that's just a way to get your character in a bad situation with him even knowing it's a bad situation. It was extreme lampshading. I wrote that. Look at my note. I wrote it in all caps. Oh. Yeah, I, like... Every time that we got to a point where the guy making the movie knew, oh, people are going to be wondering why I'm doing this, uh-huh. he would address it by going, well, I must be crazy, but I'm, you know, here we go. Yep. Like, you got to stop. That's not an explanation. No, that doesn't work. It doesn't make me believe that your character is going to do the things you're about to do. All it makes me believe is that you have decided that this is what needs to happen and you don't care why. <laughs> And part of that that same experience is the basement scene where he gets out the Ouija board mm. and he's just sitting there in the basement all by himself because he's all by himself for the entire movie. He's literally the only actor in this movie. Yes. Other than a couple of ghosts. He rambles on in this basement scene for several minutes, kind of just going over some of the same points over and right. over. And my note was just like, reshoot this. You You've done it <laughs> once. You know what things you need to say. You're going to distill it better next time. Right. Just do it again. You're it was, good. It was sort of like that was the beginning of one of the days of shooting and he was trying to kind of get back into character. And like, <laughs> yeah. and so recapping for himself all of the things that had happened. But we didn't need that because it wasn't the no. beginning of us <laughs> watching it. Yeah, it was, it was not good. Another lampshading place was where... He pulls out the Ouija board and is like, well, I know they say you're not supposed to play this game, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm like, you didn't need to address that. Like, just do it. Either your character (laughs) is dumb enough to play with a Ouija board in a haunted house or he's not. Like, you can't have it both ways. Right. Well, except he is smart enough to know not to do that, but he really needs this money. He really needs this money. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of things that are staples of these bad bed movies that were funny the first time or were like curious the first time and have long <laughs> since lost their their yeah. glamour for me. He makes a very he being the guy who's making these movies, he makes a very conscious decision to have the, this character sleep on a bed with no oh. sheets. Like it happens it in conscious? every movie. It has to be. <laughs> Maybe that's how he lives. You know why it happened? I just realized. Remember towards the end of the movie, he takes the sheet off of that TV and puts it on one of the cameras to cover it. And I thought, oh, it's funny that that's a that's a fitted sheet. And then I realized just now his sheets are all over the house covering all the furniture. <laughs> Yes, they are. Oh, and he didn't have enough sheets left over to put one on the bed that this character was going to sleep on. Like, there are pillowcases <laughs> on the pillows. Yep. He has a comforter, but there's no sheet. No sheet. Top sheet or bottom sheet. He's just on a bare mattress. Why? <laughs> like Because it's all over the house. <laughs> there's no reason for that. And it happens in every single one of the movies. And I don't, like, it really does happen often enough. That it leaves me wondering, like you said, is this how he sleeps? (laughs) Like, does he think this is normal? The other possibility I've considered as an explanation for this is that his wife, for some reason, was like, no, you can't use these sheets in this movie. (laughs) Except all over the furniture. Well, but those are all white. Like, those, like, it's possible that he went and, like, bought bulk, you know, super cheap generic sheets, right? Sure. Because the pillowcases on that bed have a pattern to them. Yeah. The sheets would have a pattern. And for some reason, maybe she's just like, no, (laughs) I don't know why, but I I don't know. know. She's willing to let him do a lot of things to this house. I mean, I'm even assuming that there is a wife involved. It's possible there's not. I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. That was one of the things where every time now I see a bed with no sheet on it, I'm like, why? And I'm (laughs) completely pulled out of what little story there is. Okay. So I want to discuss theology a little bit here. (laughs) Okay. 
the term demon, I mean, you think of that and you think of a big fiery monster with wings and that sort of thing. But it seems in this movie that a demon is kind of like, well, I guess it's a little spirit that can occupy any regular old piece of junk around the house. For example, a pile of ashes might be a demon. Right? Well, we have a, a f- complete list. We have a list of okay. all nine demons. The complete list of demons. There's the big doll, who is like a, like, I don't know, three foot tall, like one of those my friend kind of dolls. Sure. There's the little doll, who is more of a, like, you know, hinged baby doll kind of thing. There's a collection of four <laughs> voodoo dolls. Yes. That's, that are very that's one tiny. demon. They're like... They're like two inches tall each, and they're made to represent people who used to live in the house. Too small to hold a demon, so there's four of them. Right, so all four of them. And they're pretty vicious. Like, they were, like, (laughs) biting at him and stuff and trying to escape from the the urn he kept them in. I don't know. There's the ashes. Ashes. There's the Ouija board. Yes, the Ouija board is also a demon. There is the Crescent Moon Clown, who had his own whole movie. Yeah, he sure did. But who also sometimes turns into just a creepy looking clown doll. Yeah. Like a normal sized doll. There's the fire in the fireplace. <laughs> yes, that that is not just a demon. That is the president of the High Council of Demons. Indeed. And then who am I missing? I'm missing two. Oh, one of them is a legit demon. I, I can't say his name because that's dangerous. <laughs> But he was right. just like a ghostly presence. Oh, yeah, like that a was, weird kind of skull face. That would slap Tom in the face and knock him around a little bit. Yeah. Kind of a domestic abuse demon. Oh, Things. oh, you forgot the music box. I did. That's what it was. The music, the music box, box was a demon, which did the terrible demonic thing of playing music. <laughs> yes. It, Normal it's like, music. It's like it's taunting me, <laughs> he says at one point. Yes, and that one was like the the spirit of some baby that had died. Like that's sure. from the first or second movie. Yeah, I, I think. remember that was early on. Of course, in that movie, it wasn't a demon. It was just like the ghost was making it play music, like in right. a, in any normal ghost movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. This all like all of these beings were from earlier movies where he that had completely different backstories, <laughs> and and some of them were coming in because of things that had happened in between movies and whatnot. And now in this one, he kind of retcons the whole thing and is like, I found this book and it explains all of these nine demons and yeah. how they've been here for millennia and <laughs> da, 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 da. And I'm like, oh, but that doesn't match anything else that we've seen. Yeah, I think you're uh, expecting a lot here. I actually went into this one expecting nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, The other thing that is a staple of these movies is that Tom Riley will find one of the demons slash regular household items. Yeah. Capture it. They're extremely easy to capture. Yep. Yeah. And then set it somewhere while he goes to investigate in another room. Oh, again and again and again. And then the best part is when he comes back to the room and the demon is gone, the doll basically is right. gone. He's like, where did you go? Right. He's always shocked. <laughs> And he's always, like, annoyed at this unexpected setback in his progress. I'm like, yeah, really? There was a little bit of improvement in this movie because at one point he actually had them all, like, tied to a yes. a, a dolly. <laughs> <laughs> Dolls on a dolly. A mover's dolly. Like, he had them all, like, like bungeed to it and tied yeah. together and whatnot, which, of course, they escaped easily. Of it, but it took a while. Yes. I like how your note on that, I can see, is Silence of the Lambs with Dolls, and my <laughs> yes. note was Hannibal Doll. Yeah, because he had put like a like a little mask on, <laughs> on the big doll. Yeah, because of all the vicious biting she had always been doing. Right. Those little voodoo dolls are the ones that needed the masks, yeah, man. That would have been cute. <laughs> also, he put them inside that like animal cracker barrel where you yes. know like with a screw on lid which seemed smart since they were clearly going to escape yes they were like little jumping beans right from this other container they were in so he puts them in a lid or in a container with a screw on lid but all i could think was these demons are definitely smart as smart as an octopus an octopus would be able to get out of that container these demons are going to figure out how to get out of that container yeah i don't know if they ever did 
never I really saw did. him again. Because at the end of the movie, spoilers, everybody, <laughs> this is how he actually defeats the demons, is he stands in the basement and one by one says their names and says, Elgis, enter the portal. And it has to. It just does. Right. And so the jar full of voodoo dolls rolled down the stairs and into the portal. Right. Of course, all of the previous times when he tried to command the demons, you know, yeah. reveal yourself or any, all of that backfired on him, caused them to be angry, fight yeah. him. But apparently, according to the book, this is a thing that happened. This line that can only be read by a priest, much like 20 other lines in the movie. And so that came up. Over and over and over yes. again. And yet there were no consequences for him not being a consecrated priest saying these lines. Like the book yeah. was very clear about this. So many And times. he kept going, well, I'm the only one here. I guess I'm just going to have to do it. I feel like that and should have meant happened. something and it didn't mean yeah. anything. It was sort of like it was one of the bullet points, but then they <laughs> forgot to address it as a bullet point. Yeah. So he finally gets all of the demons into the portal, which I also have issues with because it's a door behind this, like, Franklin stove in the basement, which yeah. I liked. I liked the stove. But it's a door on the wall immediately behind this stove that has an eternal flame demon in it. <laughs> yeah. And not just a little flame, like, raging fire in this stove. And the stove is at most six inches away from the wall. <laughs> Maybe nine inches. I don't know. I feel like it had to be further than that. Like there was an optical illusion there because I really think he got behind the stove physically. His whole body was back there. That was not a special effect. Here's the thing. He maybe managed to jam his whole body back there, but he was definitely touching that stove in doing Yikes. so. And that's my issue. There's a door that opens. It <laughs> opened in the direction that he tried to get into the portal from. So he's blocking his path with the door yeah. to open to the portal, which couldn't have opened fully in the first place because the stove would have been in the way. And then somehow this large man manages to shove himself behind the stove through this tiny little door without ever touching this stove. I don't know. I mean, the stove might be well insulated. I, I think he really did That's go back there. That's not how stoves work. <laughs> The whole point of a stove is that it's not well insulated. The heat is out the front. The back is well protected. I'm from California. Some of us didn't grow up in a household with a Franklin stove in the middle of the living room. That's and true. And it shows. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was back there. He went back there. <sighs> I think he really did because that's more special effects than he could clearly handle based on everything else in this movie. Yes. And so I'm convinced that it's just a matter of perspective. It looked much closer than it was. Anyway, inside that tunnel was very exciting. It was, it was a TARDIS tunnel. It was a pair of tarps on the side and just the wooden floor. It was probably his living room. Probably, <laughs> He was just crawling through <laughs> between two tarps. And then the, oh. the little door in the woods. And yeah, that was exciting. And the, both of the doors. Th so the doors themselves, if I had to estimate based on, you know, him being near them and, you know, how they looked in the woods, I'd say those doors were maybe three feet by three feet, two feet by three feet. They yeah, were not big not doors. Probably not even three feet, yeah. They were not doors that he could have put himself through, <laughs> first of right. all. They were like the size of a small basement window. Like the kind of thing light can come through, but a small yeah. teenage girl would have a hard time escaping <laughs> from a wow. stalker from. Good horror reference. <laughs> but then once you're inside the tunnel, it's like six feet tall <laughs> and five or six well, feet. Well, it wasn't six or, feet tall. You know, four he was feet crawling. Wide. But it was, it was a little bit tall. He was crawling, but it was went like up to the ceiling. Like <laughs> it went up a bit. It was ridiculous. The whole thing Ugh. was ridiculous. I will agree. Ugh. Although it just occurred to me now that there probably is no door in that room, and the door that was out in the woods is the door. It was just pressed up against the wall, possibly, and just standing in the woods, sort of like. Uh, drawing of the yeah. three style. Yes, that was awesome. That was special effects. I mean, that was powerful. Just a door <laughs> floating there, and he opened it, and we could see the tunnel, but but there was nothing behind it. I mean, that was Amazing. probably the best special effects of the whole movie, <laughs> yeah, uh, the whole series, in I, fact. I think it actually probably was, although the perspective on the tunnel was, was not super right. super wrong. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I have so many things to complain about. The thing with this guy, this Tom Riley, uh -huh. I mean, 
it's it's two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, I really enjoy his super matter of fact way of dealing with demons and things. Like mm -hmm. there's parts where he's grabbing this doll that's a demon and he's he's got it and he's like, "Now look at me when I'm talking to you." And he's <laughs> trying to have a talk with this doll. And then the way he does it, like other people in movies are like, "I cast you out. I cannot abide." Or whatever they say. But the he's, dude, the dude cannot abide exactly. demons. Yes, but he he will pick up the doll and he's like, "Look, this has gotten out of hand. This has to stop." Like, that is that's not how you handle demons, but it's how he handles demons. But the flip side of that is that a demon will come through and like knock over chairs and drop stuff on the floor, mm -hmm. and his response to that is to go in and clean it all up. Like, he'll sweep the floor, put everything back where it belongs, and be like, okay, now that's handled. Except that sometimes when something like that happens, a chair falls over, uh -huh. whatever, he has, like, this intense fear reaction yes. where he, like, like <laughs> totally drops to the place. floor and backpedals into a <laughs> wall, you know? Like, ah! Ah! what the f***? Uh-huh. It's... There's no consistency to his character. That's for sure. And yeah, it just again, it goes back to the fact that he ha he there's no guidance. He he's just doing whatever he wants to do in that moment and not really thinking about cohesiveness within even a scene, much less yeah. this movie, even much less the whole series. But still, I really like when He's like confronted by demons. He's battling them and he's like, all right, well, I got to go clean up this mess in the kitchen. So I'm <laughs> yes. going to leave the demon over here and just, it'll probably stay there while I clean this mess up. Oh, it's priorities. Tom, priorities. Tom, Tom, Tom Riley. <laughs> I could go on for a very long time complaining yeah. about all of the things that bothered me about this movie. Yeah, we've hit about half my notes. Sadly... A lot of the things that bother me about this movie in movie six are probably like if I were to go back and look at or listen to our review of the first one, they're probably the same things <laughs> yes. because they were funny. They were they were entertaining in a kind of surprising way the first time. Yeah. And, and I feel like there was some element of success with that first movie. You know, I don't think that the maker of that movie got rich off of it or mm -hmm. or had any like real tangible success <laughs> but i think there was a bit of a cult following sure and i think i've talked about this in some of the other reviews that we've done throughout where like that feeling that he got from oh people liked what i did yeah yeah we talked about this and and so he's like oh i'm gonna do more of that because people like it but he's missing what it is that people liked they liked that it was unexpected yeah. And now there's literally nothing unexpected about these movies. Well, and it doesn't have the authenticity anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just how can I recapture that formula again by just churning it out? It's like Netflix using algorithms <laughs> to make their movies, only there was no budget behind this movie. Nigel Flix. It's the same idea and and it's disappointing because I do think that Nigel is funny. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's, like, if he were to take this same style of, like, just kind of having this really crass, not afraid, but I still believe that demons exist kind of character of Tom Riley and take him to other places, <laughs> Get do out other of the things, house. <laughs> it would be, there's something there that I think could be funny and entertaining, but he's... There's nothing new, except one of my complaints is that in this movie, suddenly there's a book that describes how the house uh -huh. works, yeah. how the demons in the house work, and there's a painting that in <laughs> six or five and a half movies he had never noticed before. <laughs> like, yep. very, uh, what is that called when in storytelling, when you take, when, when you just like throw something in in order to make something happen? Uh, Deus Ex Machina? And that's what's happening. Like, like, there was no reason, there was no buildup, there was no 
the lady of this who just bought this house ask me to install i mean that wouldn't have made sense but something yeah. to make us go oh there's a th- a new thing there a reason for it like sure. make it a Chekhov's painting instead yeah. of just Find pulling it, it out in of the nowhere attic, at least but it's his attic, so probably not. He couldn't find it in the attic because that attic hasn't changed an iota oh. since, like, the second movie. The that whole house hasn't. The same. The first movie. Yeah. <laughs> it. You made a comment at one point where you're like, it's sort of like he filmed all of these movies back to back to back because yeah. nothing has changed. And so I don't trust that he would be able to set it up continuity-wise to make that work. So either he did that, everything was filmed... <laughs> Like, all at the same time. Or he lives the kind of life where literally nothing has changed over the course of years. Well, it's only been, like, two or three years. I don't know. Yeah. He really cranked these movies out. Ratings! Okay, I'm going to not go on and on and on about everything that I hate about this movie and that disappointed me about this movie. (laughs) Um, I am just going to go ahead and... Give it, oh, I hate to do this. Nigel, I'm sorry, but I'm going to give this zero hell hailstones out of five. Yes, it was hailing in hell in this movie. That was fun. Yeah. I've never seen that in a movie. That's original. I mean, I sort of feel like he wanted to film that night, and it happened to be hailing in New Jersey that night. Yeah. And yes, hell is in New Jersey. (laughs) (laughs) We all knew that one already. Wow, that was harsh. I know, I'm sorry. You did it to the last one, too, which I I can understand. I've just, this series has lost all of its thrill for me. Yeah. Well, for my take, I watched this movie, and I'm kind of rolling along going, yeah, it's okay, it's pretty fun. And then just get slapped in the face with misogyny. That's the thing that, that, that gets me every time. It's like, whoa, it's just a doll, dude relax and yeah it really feels like out of place and way too angry and it makes me worry so that's the thing that kind of takes me out of this movie the insane repetitiveness the boredom there's a lot of boredom going on but it picked up towards the end um that finale was exciting i'd like to say my favorite line in the entire movie is this one what am i doing out here I should be at home finishing that book by Kel in Geneva, Red Oak Lane. Such a good book. But here I am. I mean, wow. That is some serious <laughs> product placement. The first we've seen in his series. I know. And, and later he product places uh, Matt and Amanda something. Them and Kel in Geneva are both listed as associate producers of this movie, which to me sounds like... They gave him 50 bucks so that he would plug them in the movie he made. Something like that. I don't know. Interesting. Maybe. maybe, And now we just plugged it again for free. That's a freebie, Kel and Geneva. Oh, and the uh, Matt and Amanda so-and-so, I forget what their last name was. um, I think that they, like in the movie, what he says is that they are paranormal investigators from Minnesota. Oh, yeah, that's right. They're from Minnesota. Um, So I don't know who they really are or if they really have a paranormal investigation (laughs) company and that's what they were plugging. We didn't bother to look that up. No. But the book is real. So all that said, I'm going to give my opinion of this, which is that I'm not giving a zero to a movie that has some entertainment value, which this has. You just got to find it. I mean, there's a scene where he's picked up and slammed against the ceiling. Oh, your bar for entertainment (laughs) is disturbingly low, my friend. Yeah, it wasn't good. (laughs) That was actually something I didn't like now that I I think about it. You know what I can see is that you would give it a point for the ending after he gets all the demons into the portal, which we did not yet mention. Yes. He finds out that the woman who owns the house (laughs) has been live streaming everything that's happened to him. And again, in a flash of some disturbing misogyny, yeah, he's like, well, screw her. And he releases all of the demons and leaves. What, what I like best about that is he doesn't just open the portal back up. He opens it up and yells into it. Hey, guys, come on back out. <laughs> And he's like, just leaves the house haunted, you know, because she was live streaming what happened to him. And all I could think was, dude, you need the money. (laughs) This is her monetizing what's going on. Make a deal with her. Yeah. 
That's true. She got a million hits or something. Yes! I <laughs> thought it was going to be like he was all excited. That, yeah. Like this was going to be his big break. But no, he got really angry and released all the demons he had spent the whole movie capturing. Well, I don't give it a point for that. Hmm. But the thing is, the bottom of the scale is a one. A zero is a special case of falling off the scale, mm -hmm. which Anna did. This movie does not fall off the scale. It's just at the bottom of the scale. And this gets one hell hailstone out of five. Uh, we can agree to disagree about that. That's fine. But only by one point. But only by one point. Yep. All right. Well, I'm going to officially say that I am done reviewing Bad Ben movies. Okay. Because I don't I think, think that's fair. that there's... Not that I won't watch them again. Ooh. I mean... I don't know. I'm surprised to hear that. Right? I'm not sure I'm ready to watch them again. The thing is, at some point, there's going to be another one, and we're going to be like, but what if this one has something different? So I'm going to say I'm done reviewing them. I might, you know, throw one on to see if there's something interesting about it. And if something interesting does happen, I would definitely change my mind about reviews. Oh. But at this point, you're probably not going to hear me say anything new about Bad Ben unless Bad Ben takes a pretty significant turn. Yes. And that is an official declaration from the president of the High Council of Demons. <laughs> Meeting adjourned. Don't talk, don't talk. I have to stop wiggling. <laughs>